Welcome to Lit Poetry, the podcast where we go on a journey of discovery, reading, analyzing, and discussing great poetry from around the world. Poetry is worth it because the reading and writing of poetry is a revolutionary act that has the potential to transform both the reader and our world. Welcome to the Lit Poetry Podcast and to today's poem, Preludes by T.S. Eliot. We'll begin by listening to the poem before returning to start our discussion with some biographical information about Eliot. This poem is read to you by Jeremy Irons. Preludes 1. The winter evening settles down with smell of stakes and passageways. Six o'clock, the burnt-out ends of smoky days. And now a gusty shower wraps the grimy scraps of withered leaves about your feet and newspapers from vacant lots. The showers beat on broken blinds and chimney pots, and at the corner of the street, a lonely cab horse steams and stamps. And then, the lighting of the lamps. Two. The morning comes to consciousness of faint, stale smells of beer from the sawdust trampled street with all its muddy feet that press to early coffee stands. With the other masquerades that time resumes, one thinks of all the hands that are raising dingy shades in a thousand furnished rooms. Three. You tossed a blanket from the bed. You lay upon your back and waited. You dozed and watched the night revealing the thousand sordid images of which your soul was constituted. They flickered against the ceiling. And when all the world came back and the light crept up between the shutters and you heard the sparrows in the gutters, you had such a vision of the street as the street hardly understands. Sitting along the bed's edge where you curled the papers from your hair or clasped the yellow soles of feet in the palms of both soiled hands. Four. His soul stretched tight across the skies that fade behind a city block, or trampled by insistent feet at four and five and six o'clock and short square fingers stuffing pipes and evening newspapers and eyes assured of certain certainties, the conscience of a blackened street impatient to assume the world. I am moved by fancies that are curled around these images and cling. The notion of some infinitely gentle infinitely suffering thing. Wipe your hand across your mouth and laugh. The worlds revolve like ancient women gathering fuel in vacant lots. So let's begin today's podcast with a little discussion about the historical context. Between the ages of 22 and 25, Eliot wrote the poems that comprise preludes, drawing inspiration from the experimental and progressive atmosphere of the modern era. These poems were initially published in the avant-garde magazine Blast in 1915, and were later included in Eliot's debut collection, Proofrock and Other Observations, in 1917. The sombre portrayal of contemporary urban life found in Preludes resonates strongly with Eliot's renowned poem, 
the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which has been previously discussed here at Lit Poetry. If you haven't explored that poem, I'd encourage you to do so. As far as the poem goes, Eliot's descriptions of grubby city life in preludes, combined with dreamlike, fantastic visions, were inspired in many respects by French symbolist poets. As Eliot himself said, and I quote, The kind of poetry I needed to teach me the use of my own voice did not exist in English at all. It was only to be found in French. Understanding modernism entails grasping the historical context in which it unfolded. The early 20th century was marked by significant transformations, where rapid advancements in technology, like airplanes and telephones, had a profound impact on people's lives. Within a relatively brief period, cities experienced rapid growth as a result of the migration of individuals from rural areas to urban centres. This urbanisation process led to an increased population density and reshaped societal dynamics. Added to this, the First World War had profoundly disrupted the established European system. While the conflict was taking place, when the ultimate version of Preludes was published in 1917, the reports of widespread carnage on the Western Front had profoundly shattered the ideals inherited from the preceding era. Never before had a war in Europe claimed such an immense number of lives, and never before had it been executed with such ruthless efficiency. The very technologies that had seemingly brought progress and enhanced quality of life for many were now employed to inflict mass casualties on an industrial level. As a result, modernist artists and poets like Eliot developed a profound sense of cynicism towards the modern world, which is reflected in the critical portrayal of the city in preludes. Simultaneously, modernist thinking also instigated a sense of resentment towards traditional modes of living, considering it was the old European empires that had propelled the continent into war. In essence, the modernist ideas that influenced preludes constituted both a rebellion against Victorian traditions and a rejection of those who recklessly embraced new technologies without question, embodying a dual revolution against established norms and blind confidence in progress. So I want to open up one of the central concerns of the poem, and this deals with the growing problems of modern life that Eliot believed were unfolding throughout his lifetime. Preludes presents a critique of the isolating consequences of modern urban existence, asserting that it is marked by monotony and solitude. The poem argues that urban society, in its portrayal, separates individuals from one another, resulting in the gradual erosion of their distinct identity and even compromising human morality. The city in the poem is presented as a filthy, desolate place. There are grimy scraps of withered leaves blowing around, newspapers thrown to the sidewalk, and broken blinds and chimney pots. The streets smell of steak, smoke and stale beer, and the shades in people's homes are dingy. The most copious product of urban life, it seems, is waste and decay. At first the city also seems abandoned, no people are mentioned save for the vague reference to your feet, creating an almost post-apocalyptic atmosphere of desertion. And when people do appear, they are just as dirty and dismal as the city they live in. Their muddy feet trample the ground, their palms are dirty, and their foot soles are yellow, implying disease. It's as if the city itself is passing on a contagion to the people who live in it. It is notable that the individuals depicted in preludes lack distinctive attributes and are reduced to mere body parts, emphasising the anonymity fostered by modern life. Despite coexisting within the same physical space, these individuals do not form a meaningful community. Instead, the urban environment appears to erase their individual identities, reducing them to mere collective representations of feet and hands. Eliot's use of synecdoche, 
a poetic technique defined as a figure of speech in which, most often, a part of something is used to refer to its whole, further implies that people are alienated even from controlling their own bodies, which robotically follow the routines required for modern urban living. In this world, individuals repetitively engage in the same routines day in and day out, such as opening blinds, having coffee, and trudging off to work, without giving much thought to their actions. This illustrates how cities create a sense of alienation, not only from one another, but also from their own inner selves. In other words, people become detached from their individual aspirations, necessities and yearnings due to the influence of urban environments. In Preludes, the human figures are depicted devoid of emotion, identity and agency, while the environment itself is personified. It is notable how the poem describes the evening settling down and the morning coming to consciousness. This suggests that the emotions drained from human characters have been transferred to their surroundings. It appears as though the weight of awareness itself is too burdensome for modern individuals to bear, thus requiring a larger entity, the world itself, to carry it. In the fourth poem, this concept expands beyond near consciousness to include a moral conscience. The street seems to possess an awareness of morality that the inhabitants of the world have lost. The moral conscience in Preludes takes on religious imagery, depicted as a soul that stretches tightly across the sky and is subsequently trampled by the relentless footsteps of the city's inhabitants. This decayed atmosphere within the city is portrayed as a moral transgression, as the city dwellers have willfully disregarded this collective soul that encompasses both themselves and the vast sky encompassing the earth. The lack of a return to morality at the end of the poem may be attributed to the senseless trampling of this moral conscience by the individuals who are trapped in their own patterns of behaviour. Even though a new moral consciousness is described as being impatient to assume the world, human beings are hesitant to break free from their routines. Women, for example, revert to the repetitive task of gathering fuel, and the poem's reader, addressed in the second person, can only respond with a resigned laugh. The final theme I want to discuss in this podcast today deals with the nature of time. Each individual poem in Preludes captures the repetitive activities occurring within a modern city during specific times of the day, the evening, morning, night and afternoon. The poems present the perspective that modern life is governed by artificial time constraints, compelling people to adhere to unnatural routines day after day, rather than experiencing a liberated and present existence. Among the poems in Preludes, the first two, poems one and two, exhibit the strongest emphasis on daily routines. Poem one specifically unfolds during a winter evening at six o'clock, portraying the streets as predominantly vacant. This poem commences and concludes with depictions of commonplace occurrences, people preparing dinner and the illumination of gas-powered street lamps. By framing the first poem between these repetitive activities, Eliot accentuates the dominant influence of clock-driven routines over the lives of its urban inhabitants. This concept is further developed in poem two, which delves into morning routines and contains several echoes of the first poem. These echoes include the juxtaposition of the smell of steak and the smell of beer, the sound of the cab horse's feet stamping and the presence of muddy feet going to purchase coffee, the lighting of the street lamps and individuals raising dingy shades to let light into their rooms. Through these echoes, the speaker emphasises the repetitive and cyclical nature of behaviour, even during different times of the day. This notion, in turn, underscores the limited sense of freedom experienced by individuals within the modern world. Going deeper, the second poem characterises these routines as a masquerade. 
When thinking of a masquerade, we're keeping in mind here the reference to a formal ball, where attendees would wear masks and perform rehearsed dances. The inherent repetition required for such performances bears resemblance to the repetitive routines described in preludes. Moreover, masquerade can also signify a disguise or mask, suggesting that the speaker regards clock-based time as a mere illusion. It implies that the modern concept of time is unnatural and deceptive, arbitrarily imposed to organise people's lives. The culmination of this urban routine is evident in poem 4, where the progression of 4 and 5 and 6 o'clock is compressed into a single line. Subsequently, three rapid examples of typical activities during these times are presented. Men preparing their pipes for a late smoke, the publication of the evening newspapers, and the ambiguous statement of eyes assured of certain certainties, possibly indicating the self-assured, self-satisfied expressions exchanged by adherents of such a clock-driven routine. In addition to the vivid portrayal of clock-based time, there is a significant introduction of Christian symbolism in preludes. The mention of the soul stretched tight across the skies is likely an allusion to the crucifixion of Jesus, suggesting that just as the skies encompass the city, the routines of urban life are encompassed within a larger Christian timeline. This timeline, on an immense scale, surpasses the mere masquerade of urban existence. It is described as infinite, encompassing significant events such as the fall, crucifixion and last judgment, and extending into the realm of the afterlife. Of course, the poem does not explicitly mention these specific events, while the allusion to Jesus suggests the potential for redemption from the monotonous routine of earthly life. The poem remains ambiguous about the likelihood of such a transformation. It concludes by drawing a parallel between the routine of city life and an infinite time scale. As the poem says, worlds revolve like ancient women gathering fuel. This suggests the possibility that in its repetitions, modern life may not be a significant departure from past behaviours. Rather, time is portrayed as cyclical, and modern individuals are merely following age-old universal patterns. However, this comparison is accompanied by a bitter laugh, leaving it up to the reader to determine whether it represents a profound truth about the nature of time, or a cynical jest about the inevitable suffering of humanity. So that's it for this week's episode. Time to say goodbye. I hope you enjoyed this week's poem by T.S. Eliot. Next week we'll be featuring the poem God's Grandeur by Jared Manley Hopkins. To support our work, please subscribe to the podcast or to our YouTube channel. You can also visit our website at www.litpoetry.com. A music video for this week's poem is now live on YouTube. We'll finish by listening one last time to the poem. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time. Preludes 1. The winter evening settles down with smell of steaks in passageways. Six o'clock, the burnt-out ends of smoky days. And now a gusty shower wraps the grimy scraps of withered leaves about your feet and newspapers from vacant lots. The showers beat on broken blinds and chimney pots. And at the corner of the street, a lonely cab horse steams and stamps. And then the lighting of the lamps. Two. 
The morning comes to consciousness of faint, stale smells of beer from the sawdust trampled street with all its muddy feet that press to early coffee stands. With the other masquerades that time resumes, one thinks of all the hands that are raising dingy shades in a thousand furnished rooms. Three. You tossed a blanket from the bed. You lay upon your back and waited. You dozed and watched the night revealing the thousand sordid images of which your soul was constituted. They flickered against the ceiling. And when all the world came back and the light crept up between the shutters and you heard the sparrows in the gutters, you had such a vision of the street as the street hardly understands. Sitting along the bed's edge where you curled the papers from your hair or clasped the yellow soles of feet in the palms of both soiled hands. His soul stretched tight across the skies that fade behind a city block or trampled by insistent feet at four and five and six o'clock and short square fingers stuffing pipes and evening newspapers and eyes assured of certain certainties the conscience of a blackened street impatient to assume the world. I am moved by fancies that are curled around these images and cling. The notion of some infinitely gentle, infinitely suffering thing. Wipe your hand across your mouth and laugh. The worlds revolve like ancient women gathering fuel in vacant lots. You've been listening to the Lit Poetry Podcast, presented by James Laidler. For more podcasts, poetry videos, and other useful resources, visit our website at www.litpoetry.com. Thanks for listening.